Well, hello, LinkedIn. I am here with Kara Golden, the CEO and founder of Hint. Uh, Kara, it's great to have you with me. Um, quick plug, actually, before we get it, I just want to mention uh, coming up tomorrow, uh, Coursera CEO, Jeff Magarin-Calda. So, you know, online education is huge these days, so be sure not to miss that. But that's just a quick plug. We are here today to talk to Kara. So uh, great to have you. Uh, Kara, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. And I love online education. So so I'm excited for that episode tomorrow. Yeah, tune in tomorrow. But today we want to talk about not just water, where you started and infused water. It's been about 15 years. Uh, you are a pioneer in that space and making a bunch of changes since then, but also your entrepreneurial path, because right now there are so many people who are uh, trying to figure out next steps and next phases. And you have certainly done that in spades. So um, to start off, let's just talk about today's toughest problem um, that, that you are tackling at Hint. What is it? Well, I think we're, we're all tackling this in business, which is really trying to figure out 2021, right? And, and how does that look different than uh, 2020? I mean, hopefully uh, better for business overall, and, and hopefully, you know, we'll have a vaccine soon. Um, but I think overall, the, the toughest thing for us right now is, is really, you know, that crystal ball that we're hoping for to try and understand exactly how does that affect our business? And mm -hmm. what should we be doing different? What about competition? Every time I turn around, there's a new flavored water, flavored sparkling water brand out. There's Aha uh, and Bubbly from Coke and Pepsi. I forget which is which. Liquid Death, there's a <laughs> there's a VC out of uh, Southern California, Tony Pham, who I know who's, you know, backing this canned water, almost like a skater dude uh, brand. Like everybody wants in on the water game. You're 15 years deep in it. Um, what kind of a challenge is that? Yeah, so a, a lot of the products that you mentioned are in uh, the carbonated um, space, which truly is very overcrowded and uh, is, a, in my opinion right now, a price war, um, kind of a race to the bottom. Uh, while we do have a carbonated version of our product called Hint Fizz, our core product is this product that I was just drinking, which is um, the still water, which is, uh, you know, truly... Uh, unique and different. I mean, when we started this company, what I didn't know, I thought I was just starting a beverage company with no experience, uh, no beverage experience behind me. But I didn't really understand at the time that I was actually launching a brand new category, which is called unsweetened flavored water. And we launched it in the still um, market. There were some carbonated versions, um, seltzer water. Um, most of those had sodium in it. Today, you don't necessarily have sodium in it, but you know the true like fruit um, concept. I, I think is still far and few between, <laughs> um, and and like I said, I, I think you know we're we're a little bit different in that we are really kind of we own this category. I mean, there's really nobody else in the in our category of still unsweetened water that really has done what we've done. Tell me about the direct to consumer moves that you've made your uh, it's drinkhint.com what prompted that you you know initially there was whole foods there was starbucks mm -hmm. you've done amazon there are a lot of different distribution um strategies and and sort of uh ways that you've gone at it but how, how did the direct consumer come about when did you start how's it going yeah so i was um as I mentioned before, I did not grow up in working for a Coke or Pepsi. Um, and I, I was living in the direct-to-consumer business for the last uh, few years prior to actually launching Hint, where I ran AOL's e-commerce and shopping partnerships. And I didn't think when I started Hint that that would ultimately be a viable way for consumers to buy product because I had seen that everybody in the beverage space was really focusing on stores. So we started our business in stores, but what we realized over time was that not only was there tons of competition, I mean, the beverage industry is probably 2,000 
um, beverages out there that are, you know, really vying for that shelf space. But it ends up that the uh, shelf space in so many of these large stores, which, by the way, we're in now, was, uh, you know, really owned by the big guys. And so I, so it was not only competitive to get the space, but impossible um, to kind of get the space that we ultimately needed to sort of show the consumer all 26 of our flavors and, and um, you know, make sure that we were able to, you know, kind of merchandise and do all of those things. So bottom line is we ended up originally starting on Amazon. We're still on Amazon today, but for us, we still didn't feel like we could really communicate and have the relationship with the consumer that we wanted. And, um, and so we, d we decided to grow it on drinkhint.com. Prior to March, when the pandemic hit the US, that business was about 40% of our overall business. Today, it's about 55% of our wow. overall business, huge jump. And I have to say that having a database of, you know, well over a million people in our database to actually communicate with on, you know, March 16th, which to me was really, you know, a key day to really go out and say to the consumer, hey, listen, if you're not able to find our product on the shelf because it's not getting restocked and they can't, get it from distributors or warehouses, then just go on drinkhint.com and order it directly. And I mean, it was crazy. We had something like a 60% response rate off of, you know, just letting the consumer know that they have a choice. And again, like, you know, we've grown throughout the US, we're in over 30,000 stores, um, you know, in plenty of stores, including adding during the pandemic, got a call from Costco, who said, hey, we recognize that you produce everything in the US. Um, we're having challenges with some mm. of the companies that we deal with trying to get stuff from overseas during this time. So can we flip the switch on all of our warehouses? Um, you know, all of that happened. We knew 2020 was going to be a big year um, going into 2020, because we were going into Walmart and Aldi and smart and final and lots of lots of huge distribution but i think that the fact that we had that relationship with the consumer when they were trying to figure out do i actually go to a store do yeah. i you know what what or i can't find that specific flavor so that for us has really been a saving grace so you talk about a database of more than a million people and so then that makes me wonder about what you've done on Drink Hint with Direct. We're looking at it now. You've got more than water. You've got face masks. You've got hand sanitizer. You've got uh, sun and body. Uh, what's, the, what's the thought there? How is that going? What kind of a percentage of overall revenue is it? Tell me about strategy. Yeah, so our core product is still the still water. And like I said, we have the carbonated, we have caffeinated water. But when we launched a few years ago, the sunscreen, um, that was really out of, you know, my own experience with trying to find a sunscreen. I'm a redhead. I had some precancer basal cells on my nose that I was trying to figure out, you know, what sunscreen do I ultimately wear? And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, when I actually found a quality sunscreen that I really wanted to wear and trusted wearing, it was like $40 plus from my dermatologist. And so that for me was, you know, again, I was a consumer or trying to be a consumer and was just frustrated with the options. And so I developed it, it went back to my kitchen where I had developed the water and, uh, you know, another place where basically we were able to kind of test whether or not we thought it was a viable product was in our online, you know, store where we put it up on drinkhint.com and that customer who we knew cared about health and cared about, you know, how many sweeteners they were putting into their body, it ends up that they actually care about what they're putting on their skin as well. And the other thing that we did was really call attention to an ingredient that I had stumbled upon, which is called oxybenzone. Um, and so prior to us actually launching our sunscreen, nobody was actually calling out oxybenzone on the front of their bottle saying no oxybenzone. Not only were we already really helping consumers figure out, you know, what 
to put in their body and potentially what to put on their body. But after that, we saw huge sunscreen brands actually putting no oxybenzone on, on their label. So yeah. we really believe that we not only can help consumers to, to find health, but we can also kind of lead categories and lead large companies to reformulate and ultimately do better. Mm. Uh, now give me a sense Let's go way back. Mm -hmm. Give me a sense of, of how you got to where you are, but let's start at the like very, very beginning. Where were you born? Where'd you grow up? Um, so I, I moved when I was just a couple of years old to uh, Arizona, uh, to Phoenix, uh, Scottsdale area. If you know where Camelback Mountain is, I grew up right below Camelback Mountain. And, and uh, for those of you who have visited uh, that area, and I like to say we were, I was in, part of the original settlers. Um, there were only like 100,000 people in Phoenix and Scottsdale at the time. <laughs> and, um, you know, really like, uh, you know, super middle class upbringing. I mean, five kids, I was the last of five. I, I you know, had to fend for myself many times because uh, my, uh, my brothers who were a couple years older um, you know, we're a little naughty. So I think my parents were exhausted. And, and so, you know, I think it, it gave me a lot of liberty to, to really go and try. And, you know, it's part of what I, you know, talk about in my new book um, that is launching just on Tuesday next week, which is, it's called Undaunted, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. I, you know, really encourage people to just go try. Because if you don't ultimately go try and you sit there and force your, or, or really like get blocked by this wall that's sitting in front of you all the time, then, then you for sure won't go start a company, you know, change jobs, go and go move from Arizona to New York. Like you just have to go out and get rid of your own doubts, stop listening to the doubters and ultimately go try. And sure, you know, you'll definitely have failures along the way. It's another thing I talk about in the book that I think owning, you know, when things didn't go exactly right, learning from your experiences so that the next time um, you can be better, which I, I think is something that is, is uh, you know, really not talked about in entrepreneurism either. Instead, especially with female entrepreneurs, I'm constantly hearing, you know, female entrepreneurs like they're unicorns and or their company failed. I mean, it's like there's a lot in between in terms of, you know, really looking at that journey and kind of, you know, what they ultimately did to kind of, you know, help consumers, change consumer behavior um, and and kind of the challenges and some of the stuff that they went through. Tell me about, first of all, what you were into as a kid. What what were you passionate about from the beginning? What's the root of that entrepreneurial drive? Um, so I was always doing uh, some kind of sport. That was like the one rule in our family that we always had to be doing something. I was a gymnast, a runner, um, and, uh, you know, did all kinds of other things. Tennis, softball, wasn't ever very good at those things. Um, but I think, you know, I was always trying to kind of create my own little businesses. And again, nobody ever told me that I, I couldn't. A friend reminded me the other day that I started a camp uh, when I was 12 years old, a summer camp. Sounds kind of crazy now in the middle of summer <laughs> in, in Arizona. Um, and uh, basically the idea was to build a town and uh, it originally was a city, but then I decided that was a, a little overwhelming. So I'd, you know, we'd build a town and we'd get a bunch of boxes from the grocery store and then ask everybody to color. And it was sold out for two weeks. And my friend Robin and I, you know, did it. And basically, you know, a lot of lessons there when I'm th like, we're learned just from thinking back, we had no idea what to charge people. We went on the corner with a sign and, and said, uh, you know, we'll take your kid for five bucks a day and you know, <laughs> we'll have a lot of fun. And I don't know, it seemed, seemed good. And, you know, and then I think we asked for six at one point and people were like, Oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. An extra dollar. We were like, that's okay. We'll just go with five. We had no idea what we were talking about. But again, like, you know, we laugh about it now and we laughed then too. I mean, and that's the thing that I think people forget. Like, they're like, Oh, I can't go start a company. I, you know, can't go do these things because they have all this fear. 
in front of them. And I feel like just through telling my stories, like I always wanted to have fun. And I always like felt like, you know, I don't know, we might fail, but it'd be really funny to be able to talk about this. And I still talk about these stories, you know, many years later, or people that I sort of recruited to come and do this stuff with me. And they're still, you know, they're still laughing because they were just ridiculous, right? And but all along the way, you know, I think we we had fun. And and I think, you know, again, like today, Hint is the largest non-alcoholic beverage in the country that doesn't have a relationship with Coke or Pepsi. I mean, that's huge. Right. Like that's like that. I didn't start out by thinking like I am going to go and do that. But if you just go try and every day you keep picking away at, you know, like, OK, here's this challenge. Here's this challenge. Here's this challenge. And it was something I really believed in around health that I didn't see in the market. I, I'm a huge believer that, you know, you just got to go try. Why don't you have a relationship with Coke or Pepsi? I mean, Lots of people eventually sell to a big player, whether it's one of them or some other big beverage company. Have you thought about that? You know, I think the thing that we've really focused on, that we've always focused on since day one, is really helping consumers to drink water. And so, um, you know, I had a challenge with drinking water. I was a huge diet soda addict. Um, and when I gave up drinking diet soda 15 years ago, I realized how unhealthy I was. I never really thought the word diet was like unhealthy, dangerous un until I gave it up. And then I lost 24 pounds in two and a half weeks. I had terrible adult acne that just went away. Um, I My energy levels went up. And that's when I really started kind of questioning this whole, you know, how I had been sold this like healthy perception product versus healthy reality. And unfortunately, you know, the, the challenge I think with a lot of these soda companies is, is not too dissimilar to what we've seen in other historically, what we've seen in other industries where, you know, they're, they're holding on to something that maybe the consumer doesn't want anymore. Right. Maybe the consumer ultimately wants to get healthy and, and so I think that that is, um, while we've had various conversations over the years, um, I, I really believe that we felt like we need to just go build this thing and really, you know, help the consumer and what will come, it will come. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think more than anything, we've now built a standalone brand and not only did we expect or, or not expect to kind of do what we did and direct to consumer. There's no beverage that is doing what we're doing in direct to consumer. And again, the information that we're able to really see clearly is that this consumer that's shopping online is also really interested in overall, overall health. They mm -hmm. might not have thought about sunscreen or deodorant or hand sanitizers as, you know, healthy but when they hear that hint has is basically showing them there's there's a trust there that we've developed with this consumer over the last 15 years that's and, really interesting yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well i want to i want to move forward a bit on the timeline because you've talked a lot about taking chances and entrepreneurialism and yet for a while you're working for other folks so tell me what you thought you were going to do tell me about what you kind of got to went to college for or you know studied or got into and and then what your plan was after that yeah so i i went to school in arizona and uh was a journalism major and Ooh. and really thought that i was going to do, do something in journalism do what you're doing and uh I, I don't know but i was also a minor in finance and uh and I think for me, I, I really, again, I wanted to do something that I'd wake up every single day and be excited to go and do. And I, I was that that's when I, you know, literally got on a plane ticket on a plane and bought a plane ticket and moved to New York. And, you know, that's another story in the book about, you know, it was a year when apparently it was really tough to find a job. Nobody told me that, that it was tough to find a job. And so this is before there was security in, uh, in the building that I went to in, in uh, New York. I, I marched in there and, and, uh, 
and just said, hey, I, I'm really interested in working for you. And they didn't really know what to do with me. And I didn't end up getting the job that I wanted. But what I did offer is that, hey, I'll, I'll take a job anywhere in the building. I just want to get my foot in the door. And, you know, you come in with this can do attitude and, you know, like, you know, you, you appear that you're somebody that's fun to work with and that's curious. And I, I think that there is no bad time to go looking for a job for people like that. I mean, how many times have, have you interviewed people where it's not just about what's on their resume? It's just like, did you enjoy talking to them? Right. Did you, yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that's half the battle and, and it doesn't matter, you know, what school you went to or, you know, what your experience is, if you really have this drive that people can feel that I think that's super key. So then what industry did you go into? You ended up working for AOL. Yeah. So I, so I started out actually at time uh, magazine and then I wanted to I work for time Inc myself business yeah. 2 and fortune. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I wanted to work for fortune and um, Marshall Loeb at the time was the managing director and you know, he wrote me a Dear John letter, basically, if you're ever in the New York area, definitely uh, let me know. And, and uh, yeah, that that never happened. Um, but I ended up working at time and had a great, great time there. And then ended up going to CNN um, after that. And, you know, it was in the early years of, you know, Ted Turner, and so many great stories from there and really hockey stick growth. And then ended up moving to San Francisco. And uh, I had been following uh, a guy named Steve Jobs, who I was incredibly impressed with how he, you know, really made things beautiful and simple and exactly what I needed. Um, and that was um, when I read an article in the Wall Street Journal about this little spin out that had been Steve's idea that it, it had spun out of Apple and it was CD-ROM shopping. And so I reached out, picked up the phone uh, for the person quoted in the Wall Street Journal. And I said, hey, listen, I just moved to San Francisco. I, you know, not looking for a job. I just really want to, um, I'm just curious about this industry when everybody's doing, you know, different shopping platforms from the cable companies um, and, I, I'm just curious what you guys are up to. And when I went and had that meeting, um, I, I offered to buy him coffee and seemed to work. And when I had that meeting, I, you know, remember really understanding the concept and then kind of just had this idea in my head that really stemmed from time and from, you know, CNN, which was like, I don't really understand how you guys make money. And I'll never forget, you know, the the response to that, which was, well, we haven't really figured that out yet. You know, typical <laughs> Silicon Valley, like, you know, sure. episode, right? And it haven't really figured that out yet. And I was like, oh, okay, okay, well, you know, good luck. And I and I left and then I got a phone call from them saying, uh, yeah, you know, we were really kind of curious, like you've worked at some interesting company, like how do you think we should make money? And uh, And that's when, you know, I, I got a job offer to run the partnerships um, for this little CD-ROM company. Um, and then AOL was uh, was an investor in our company and then they acquired us. And uh, and so then I I went to I went on to run AOL's um, shopping and e-commerce partnerships and and, uh, you know, had a great you know, ride there. It was really the the mecca of, you know, AOL's kind of uplift and then all my former companies came together in one and mm -hmm. that's that's when i you know decided in addition to the fact that i was um i, I just had three kids um somehow um <laughs> for all my travels and, that and, into the story somehow yeah, yeah and so uh and my husband was a, a silicon valley attorney um and you know didn't want to take another bar exam so we were sort of like and we love san francisco so we were like you know i, I think it, there's so many people that are, or so many companies that were cropping up, um, you know, when I was making this decision and I wanted to spend some time with my young kids. So that's when I really kind of got off the, the tech bus at that point. And I think for me, I, I just really started to look at, I mean, 9-11, just like a lot of other people, that was, that was a time when, you know, I loved living in New York. It meant a lot to me. It was, you know, it, shocking. And I thought if, if there's no tomorrow, 
you know, frankly, am I doing what I ultimately want to be doing? And, and that for me was like helping people and, you know, not only helping myself, but, you know, also just thinking back on, on, you know, what do I really, what, like, what will be the, the imprint of my life and for these young kids. And that's when I really, you know, thought I want to do something. And I kept thinking that it was kind of a nonprofit. Um, well, tell me, yeah. tell me about that time, because I hear this a lot from entrepreneurs, uh, from CEOs, from HR directors, from people who are really focusing on the idea of especially female talent. Uh, mm -hmm. Going through different life stages, um, you know, having different concerns both in the workplace and outside. How do you move from perhaps a stage of singular focus on career to a stage more broadly interested in in family, and then re-enter the workforce better than you left it? What were you going through at the time, having made that transition, had your kids, and then looking at perhaps doing something entrepreneurial? What was your mindset? Did you have doubts? I I had plenty of doubts and, uh, and you know, was looking at a lot of different opportunities and nonprofits. What the most, the, the hardest thing for me at that time, thinking back was at AOL, it was such a rocket ship. I mean, it was, it was crazy and things moved very, very fast. And when I was looking at the nonprofits, I, I felt like everything moved so slow. Um, so I joke that, you know, in many ways, AOL ruined me because I wanted something that was just more exciting and things got done really quickly and not a lot of meetings and nothing getting done. And so I couldn't find that. And that's when I decided to get healthy and like start working out. And really, there had been this new store, Whole Foods, that opened. And I thought I'm going to, you know, start eating healthier and and um, and really get this weight off that I had to I had earned over, you know, the last few years. And that's when, you know, I really came up with this idea. Um, I wasn't thinking that I was going to be an entrepreneur. I sort of like had these kind of frustrations, as I just mentioned, with some of the roles that I was looking at. But I also felt like just, um, you know, my life stage of, of kind of what mattered to me and what I was trying to fix. I never really worried, though. It's interesting that you mentioned that about, you know, going and spending time with your family. I, it, it was not, I think more people worried about me, like taking, you know, two years off than I really, you know, worried, right? Like I, I just kept thinking, you know, so my dad actually said something to me a long time ago, which I, which, you know, he didn't even really know the impact of it, which was no one can take away what you've done. Right. And so I kept thinking, like, I've built something pretty great. And, you know, I don't know, I, I like take some time to really kind of readjust. But everybody said, if you take, you know, I took two years off, like everybody kept saying, if you take more time than that, like, it's terrible. I'm like, so what exactly is the time? Like, nobody really knows. I think people just kind of, you know, go along with it. And, and um, yeah, so I mean, that was that was really the moment where Look, I people ask me all the time, did I want to be an entrepreneur? I don't think so. But now when I look back, there were so many things like, you know, that I that I was already doing along the way or that I really enjoyed doing in these large companies that were very entrepreneurial and innovative, et cetera. But when I ultimately dropped drinking my diet soda and started, you know, creating my own homemade hint at home, that's when I saw this hole in the market. And I thought if I can just go do this and like change, help change other people's health. Not only do I feel good about it, but you know, these young kids, I had four kids under the age of six and started this company. I mean, it sounds four. really daunting, right? You know, I and we were at three where there was a, another kid just popped into the store. Yeah, right? So I, I, I was pregnant. I didn't realize it when I was pregnant when I made the decision to go and try and get my product into Whole Foods. And, wow. and, um, and so then again, I, I uh, you know, had written this little business plan at home. And then I thought, gosh, if I can like 
just get it on the shelf before my fourth is born, then maybe I'll actually take a little time off for maternity leave. I had no idea what I was talking about, but you know, the fact that I actually created a product and got it on the shelf within six months, when I talked to beverage executives, they're like, wait, what? Like this stuff usually takes a couple of years. So I was like, again, you know, nobody told me that that's what, you know, is supposed to happen. And, and so I just, yeah, so I didn't know, but you know, how, I, yeah. how did you scale a business and scale for humans at the same time? Like what, what kind of help, what kind of collaboration, what kind of partnership, what kind of planning? I mean, you know, my wife and I have enough struggle with two and, and we're not starting a business. Yeah. So what was interesting is as I was, you know, coming up with this crazy idea, um, you know, I decided it was time to, you know, this is when I just learned that I was pregnant with our fourth, I decided since I need money to actually go run the product and, you know, buy the bottles and the caps and everything. I was taking $50,000 out of our joint personal um, account at, at home. I thought it was a good idea to let my husband know so he didn't think I was running off to Jamaica with girlfriends or something, right? And so, um, you know, he thought it was a terrible idea. He's like, wait, what? What? Like, why are you going into the beverage in industry and trying to do something? And again, like, I had made some money at AOL and he wasn't going to argue with me. He just was really clear that he thought it was a bad idea. And, but then I think at that point, when he really saw the bigger picture around what I was trying to do, it was really, you know, change health. And as I articulated, actually change health, not only in America, but the world, if we could get people to enjoy water again, you know, we wouldn't have as many health issues, type two diabetes and lots of other things that were out there. So he, at that point, help me, um, you know, drive in our Grand Cherokee, drive the cases around um, and, and, you know, really help out. And so, you know, a lot of people have said to me, like, oh, I could never work with my husband. And I mean, that's totally true for so many people. We're just very, very different people and, and kind of appreciate each other's skill sets. Um, but also raising a family and raising a business were the only two things we cared about. Like I often look at couples who are both trying to work and, you know, like one job is more important than the other, right? Or that's what the arguments are about. And I think that we never had those arguments because we cared about our family, we cared about, you know, our business. And so, you know, 25 years later, um, and, you know, for our marriage and 15 years, you know, later for the company, I think that there's definitely this yin and yang that has gone on. And, you know, for those of you who have very young kids and you're thinking about how do I, you know, mesh the, the two together, I, you know, now my kids are, uh, you know, three in college and one still in high school. That one's was, 15 from the sound of it. Yeah. So he was um, exactly. So he was delivered the day that I was actually getting our first case um, on the shelf uh, that you'll read all about it in, in the book. But I think what I've rec recognized is I don't know if my kids will be entrepreneurs, if they'll work at Hint or what they'll end up doing. But you know, I, I know that they're they're very smart kids who also recognize that, you know, women, their mom can be a CEO of a company. Um, you can actually do good um, in the world um, it, for in a for profit company. Um, I'm also working on a huge initiative in Washington right now around clean water and trying to clean up our you know, water supply based on what I've learned um, just from running a beverage company, um, running a water company about you know, the current state of our water. Um, and so again, like being a role model, not only you know, for women, but also being a role model for kids, I think has you know, definitely, uh, you know, it's impacted my kids to sort of watch us going up against the big guys and the soda guys. And, and uh, you know, the thing they, they know about equity, they know about, you know, lots of different things that I certainly didn't know, um, you know, growing up. Um, so, you know, you can you can raise smart kids when you also talk to them and, and you know, and, and enjoy what you're doing every single day, too. I yeah. think like, that's another aspect of it. What has been the hardest time? I, I call it Death Valley, but was there a time when you thought either with Hint or, or even a different period in life, maybe this whole plan that I have is not going to work out. 
maybe I need to just drop this and go in a different different direction. Maybe I'm not up to it. Maybe I'm not good enough. What's been the toughest time? So many doubts along the way. I mean, certainly getting it on the shelf and hearing from uh, a soda executive that, you know, it actually uh, the soda executive shared with me who I really felt like industry experience, you know, he's going to be able to, you know, know what he's talking about and, and uh, shared with me, sweetie, Americans love sweet. Uh, this product isn't going anywhere. And I still like believed based on what I was seeing. Um, but probably one of the biggest stories, and again, you know, looking back on sort of challenges, failures as what did I learn there was when we had a relationship with Starbucks, um, all 11,000 stores uh, a few years back. And, you know, really ask questions ahead of time to know, okay, you know, what is success? And, you know, we thought we had it all figured out. And by six months into the partnership, we were doing three times what we were supposed to be, you know, what, what success was. So we were feeling pretty confident and good about the relationship. A year and a half into the relationship, we got a phone call from uh, one of the buyers who, the new buyer, who said that we were going to be removed from Starbucks. And my response was like, how could that be? I mean, we're, we're doing great. What, like, how can you do that? And, um, you know, the, the reply back from senior management at, at Starbucks was that they were going to put um, higher margin, higher ring stuff in the case, food. Um, into the case where they really hadn't done that um, to this point. And so, you know, it was a it was a hard day primarily because 40% of my overall business was in Starbucks. And so when when you know senior management at Starbucks woke up and said, let's discontinue hint next week, I had six months worth of inventory in my warehouse. I had to go back and you know, millions of dollars. I had to go back and talk to my investors about, you know, potentially we were going to have to destroy the product because it was going to go bad, all of these things. And somewhere in there, I felt like, you know, obviously it was, you know, right for their business. It wasn't right for my business, but it didn't matter at the time because I was really, you know, trying to figure out if I was going to be able to survive or if this was going to tank it. Today, like I look at that time and, and, it's a longer story, but I, you know, that actually, we, we got a phone call from an Amazon buyer at this point and, uh, you know, shared with us that we were, they were going to be, you know, starting this grocery business and really blowing it up and turning it, you know, Amazon prime and all of this. And, uh, he had been buying our product at Starbucks. And so <laughs> I go back and I think, First of all, I didn't I didn't actually share with him that we were getting kicked out of Starbucks, um, but or we had just been kicked out of Starbucks. But in addition to that, um, you know, I think it was that moment when I really realized that sometimes when really hard things happen, like they kind of you have to be very aware to kind of watch for what good might come out of it. Right. The fact that Starbucks paid us and exposed us to, you know, every state, every city in America, um, and, and for a year and a half and really grew the brand. And now we were going to be able to tell those consumers that had bought our product in Starbucks that they could go on Amazon and, and find our product. And, and in addition, you know, I talked earlier about our direct to consumer business. I'm not sure I would have really had like the courage to launch our direct to consumer business, even though I had been at AOL and knew a lot about, you know, e-commerce and, and how consumers potentially would be shopping. Amazon really showed me that consumers would shop this way. The, the biggest challenge, and we're still on Amazon and we love Amazon. We still do great with Amazon. The biggest challenge with Amazon was that no, you know, no different than any other retailer is that they don't give, you know, companies like me, their suppliers, their, the data. It's mm. Jeff Bezos' data and it's Whole Foods' data and Kroger and Costco and everybody else. So I think like the, there were so many lessons learned first appreciate sort of what's happened and, you know, and understand that maybe that's part of the journey and the reason. Um, but also like having, having your business with somebody else, like 40% of your business, where if it goes away tomorrow, um, you know, maybe 
you've got viewers who are thinking about the pandemic, like they're, you know, did their business tank um, because of a pandemic? Can you actually look at this time to better prepare yourself for, you know, the next big thing that happens, right? Yeah. Like I think all these lessons learned, you can't really, you know, prevent what's just happened. And did I couldn't, the, yeah. Did, did the Starbucks experience and the Amazon showing up give you a mindset where you can't get comfortable? I mean, cause you talked about the courage that you got from having had that dislocating experience. It, it also makes me think, well, you didn't get comfortable with Amazon either. You started this direct to consumer business, not knowing we were going to have a pandemic. Now you have this asset of a mailing list, you know, and consumers who you can introduce to, to more product. W was there a core belief, <laughs> I guess, or a mindset that came out of that dislocation more specifically? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's okay to always be a little paranoid. Right. And, and I, 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 you know, think every experience that you have along the way, um, whether it's childhood or, you know, partnerships or jobs or whatever, it's okay to be a little bit paranoid, right? And and I think instead, accept a little bit of paranoia, but also, uh, you know, learn from your lessons, learn, learn lessons, I should say, from your mistakes, or maybe challenges that you had along the way that you you know, couldn't do anything about. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, that that's probably a big one. Um, I think there's also lessons. And one of the things I talk about in the book, too, is sometimes you can't, um, you know, you have to accept that you can't do anything about it. Did we do anything wrong, at, you know, with Starbucks, other than the fact that we had 40% of our business in that channel? No, I mean, we were, we were, doing three times what they told us, right? But sometimes things are out of your control and you have to, you know, you you have to be better diversified and, you know, to, in, in the case of, you know, sales and distribution, to be able to really weather those kind of storms. And I think that that's such a, you know, that that's such a key thing. I would also say too, that, you know, kind of always thinking about trying to predict like what's next. I mean, you have no idea what's what's next ultimately, but I think that that's been something, you know, along the way where we've always, you know, wanted to be a little bit ahead of the curve. I mean, when we started our direct to consumer business, no one was doing direct to consumer. They're they're starting to do it now, but just because you're a little ahead of the curve doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Mm, we got a question here uh, from a viewer that I want to get to. It almost sounds like maybe he read this somewhere. I don't know. Are simplicity, honesty, learning, and customer education the key differentiators that Hint focuses on? Yeah, I mean, I think health is definitely you know up there as well. Um, but I think that that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, when I look at, at at the product and what we hear back from consumers, it's definitely, I think you have to today have a great tasting product. I don't, I think gone are the days where you can like launch a beverage company as an example that tastes terrible. Um, it, but I think it's more than that. Was it's there actually, ever that day? Yeah, oh, I, I do think so. I mean, uh, you know, it's... Uh, I, I haven't, there, there are certain energy drinks that are out there where I, I don't think every, anyone's ever bought those for the taste, <laughs> right? And, and okay, you know, yeah. I'll leave it at that. But I think that, you know, it was the only time in history that I can really, you know, think of where, where companies gotten that big, where people, you know, didn't want to um, or that people accepted a bad taste. I don't think you can do that anymore. But I do believe that the package, the packaging, the bottle, the the feel of it is really, um, you know, the labels. Um, you know, I think the interesting thing when I run into customers and and what they share with me is how Hint has helped them, and that is a consistent thread that I get back from you know customers or. You know, when I'm at a conference and people get all excited about Hint, 
And so having a brand that is less than $2, right? And having that relationship and that experience um, really goes back to what you just mentioned, the simplicity. Um, but I, I also think that the help word is one that I, you know, I think about often because I've never written to a company to say you've you've helped me. Have you? No. Right? Um, right. That's yeah. a that's a big decision, right? And and I get those emails weekly. Hmm. So I mean that's that's a powerful thing for a consumer product company to you know have. And and frankly, like the thing that really keeps me going, right? To be able to like work on something where people say, wow, you really helped me. I mean, it's exactly what I was looking for in a company. Like I, you know, I, I think about, you know, people frequently talk to me about, you know, balance and like having home life versus like business life. I'm like, I'm really lucky because I love what I do right? I love what I do. And I drink my product every, you know, while I'm at home, right? Like I, I love every aspect. I'm really fortunate because I, I was able to do what I love. And I, and I think if, if people go and figure out what they ultimately love to do every single day and, you know, support a brand and, or start a brand, then I, I think it's not really work. It's really, it's something that you, you know, love doing and helping people. You say you just started this relationship with Walmart where you're in with it. And yet at the same time, direct to consumer is more than half. It's the majority of your business right now. Um, something must be going on either in the pandemic, people are drinking less hint or your direct to consumer business is absolutely booming, giving a sense of the dynamic there. Um, very different. I mean, look, I think at the end of the day, consumers are um, consumers are in control of where they buy things. And I think that if you are a retailer and, you know, whether it's Walmart or otherwise, and think that that, you know, you can control where the consumer is going to shop. I mean, it's, it's incorrect. Right. And so we as a brand want the consumer to be able to to choose where where they ultimately buy. I think that the interesting thing about Walmart, um, you know, over the years, we, we've had conversations with Walmart and we really just weren't sure whether or not we were big enough as a brand to actually go into Walmart. And I think that the biggest thing that we've seen and our customers were really requesting that we ultimately go into Walmart is that there are many places in America where um, people are suffering um, from not having access to good foods. And, you know, maybe they don't have a Whole Foods or, you know, a specialty market or, you know, or, you know, their local grocery store is Walmart. And in addition, I feel like, you know, health has really impacted so many of these communities. Um, you know, type 2 diabetes, when I first started this company 15 years ago, was 2% of the population. Now it's 15, or excuse me, 45% of the population has type 2 diabetes or prediabetes. And unfortunately, you 45, know, that, really? Yeah. So unfortunately, that's in, you know, communities that are, you know, having challenges with actually getting access to, you know, great and healthy food. So, so for us, it was really a vehicle um, to go into, you know, like I said, Walmart, Costco, some of these, you know, Sam's Club, because we really wanted to access the consumer. And, you know, and still today, what's what's interesting is those same people that are shopping from us online or through Amazon, they also still go into Walmart and Target and Costco. I mean, I certainly do. You know, I like I, I don't just limit my shopping to one store. And so I, I really, really believe that, you know, 2020 is really going to be the year where we've seen that the consumer is really king. I mean, they 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 make the decisions on how they shop and and where they're going to shop. And you as a you know, whether you're a retailer or an online merchant, you have to have the products that they ultimately want. And I think 
There's nobody that I've met over the last, whatever, seven, eight months who isn't talking about staying healthy and sure. trying to figure out how they stay healthy, whether it doesn't matter your gender or where you're living. I mean, it's, it is a key conversation. And I, I think that you've got to have products that are truly speaking about health and otherwise you're going to miss this consumer. I'm seeing the American Diabetes Association saying uh, ten and a half percent of the population um, has uh, diabetes in 2018. But still, I mean, I'm, I'm sure when you add pre-diabetes in there, it's a bigger number. That's still quite. Is that a bit. type one or type two? Uh, I, I don't know. It's just yeah. the, the overall diabetes number that the American Diabetes Association gives, which uh, to to your larger point is a lot of people. I don't know if you. Just, split it by adults and or over a certain age or in certain areas, if you got a, a bigger percentage. Well, finally, I, I want to ask what's next evolution wise for Hint itself. If you don't have a specific plan that you're willing to divulge to the market and Coke and Pepsi and everybody, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe just for the brand or things that you're considering, you've moved into direct to consumer. We're in this pandemic period. You have, a closer relationship with the customer than probably arguably other independent brands. What do you do with that? You know, I think we, we continue to really help the consumer and, and what I've seen, um, you know, through this pandemic is that the consumer really does need the help and, you know, and, and they want to stay healthy. So we continue to, to do that. But, um, but I, I think we're very, very different than a typical beverage company. And that again, like, you know, how many beverage companies are actually out there talking about your health? I mean, it's just not, you know, instead it's about, okay, what celebrity can I, you know, throw on the billboard or athlete or whatever to sort of get people to come and buy my product or or use funky names right that get people to think that you're healthier than you are for us i mean if you meet people who are you know hint fans i mean they will talk to you about health and and i think that that is what we continue to do obviously great taste and all of that we continue to launch lots and lots of flavors and choice for consumers, but I think it's really focusing on continuing to focus on the health aspect. All right. Well, Kara Golden, CEO of Hint and founder, uh, and, 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 um, you know, so, so many things that you've done. It's been great uh, talking to you. Thanks for sharing your story, for sharing a sense of, of what Hint is doing and, and the purpose behind the brand. Thank you so much. And everybody, I just want to remind you, tomorrow, Friday, uh, the 16th, Coursera CEO, Jeff Nagancalda, is going to be with me here on Fort Knox. I will see you next time, which is tomorrow. <laughs>